Vishan Chakrabarti is Dean of the College of Environmental Design at Berkeley, San Francisco. He's the founder of Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, or POW. Uh, it, that was the studio he established in 2015 and which he continues to lead. He also served as director of the Manhattan office for New York's Department of City Planning from 2002 to 2005, overseeing planning and development for the borough during the critical period of rebuilding that followed the September the 11th terrorist attacks. Uh, so Vishan, after 9-11, there were significant changes to the planning of Manhattan uh, beyond the World Trade Center itself. Uh, more mixed use in Lower Manhattan, more public and green spaces, just the sort of changes that seem relevant to cities as they emerge from the pandemic. So what lessons do you think we can learn today from uh, New York's response to uh, that tragedy? Uh, thank you, Peter. It's wonderful to be with you. I think we can learn a lot from that tragedy. First, I think we have to be careful about all of the fortune telling that's going on. Uh, there's a remarkably similar kind of dynamic, I feel like, that's going on in terms of people talking about the end of cities, the death of cities, that this pandemic is going to bring density to a halt, mass transit to a halt. We heard all the same things right after 9-11. Uh, you know, no one would build a tall building again. People would abandon the cities due to safety concerns. Um, and what it took was a bunch of people who are dedicated to the basic idea of the city. Because I think the city, more than an economic artifact, is a cultural artifact that is based on human connectedness. Human beings need and want to be around each other. No pandemic, no terrorist attack, no anything is going to change that fundamental aspect of who we are. And I think if smart people think that somehow, you know, in the years that follow, we are going to um, have all of our young human capital be working in their parents' basements rather than out in cities, in streets, in pubs, in, in restaurants. We've all lost our minds if we think that's the future. So a, a, a dense and vital center is a pretty essential part of any global city, whether it's San Francisco, New York or, or London. And the, the benefits of agglomeration, you say, are, are, are currently sort of under threat from COVID-19. And I noticed that on the POW website, you show a diagram of the, the 20 minute city, um, which I guess, as opposed to Carlos Moreno's 15 minute city. but. Um, how, how does that work? Because isn't there a danger that if we create a, a, a polycentric city with no heart, no core, um, and we're left with a suburban city, you lose that uh, vitality that is so important? Well, I mean, Peter, you are sitting in the uh, world's most successful model of the polycentric city in London. San Francisco is quite polycentric. And of course, there will always need to be a downtown. The thing that's important to understand about that diagram that's on our website is that that is still within the boundaries of the city. What it's really talking about, so for years, you know, our office has been working on the Domino Project, for instance, in the Williamsburg waterfront in Brooklyn. That is a new node in our city in terms of a magnificent new waterfront park, mixed use, new office space, heritage buildings, as well as new buildings, you know, and a lot of the things that, you know, people like Jane Jacobs wrote about. And so I think this idea that um, we all have to commute into one central business district is problematic. And it's not, you know, Midtown Manhattan is one thing, and it's a very important vital thing, but it's not going to be the only place where people work in a big city like New York. And so I don't think, I, I think it's a false choice between saying, well, it's about the downtown or the polycentric city. I think you can have both. And I think London is the clearest, best example of it. Um, to me, though, the larger issue is how do we, coming out of this pandemic, create better versions of that polycentric city? Because most of our transportation systems, and London's actually a little different in this regard, but if you look at New York's subway system, for instance, or San Francisco's BART system, everything is about bringing people to that central business district. And this is why I think if we're going to try to build that, that true polycentric city, 
we need uh, better bicycle infrastructure. We need better bus infrastructure. We need fewer private automobiles. I know you're a big bicyclist in the city. And I think it's really important that we come out of this pandemic rethinking the way we use our city streets so that you know our, our, these areas have a chance to thrive. But I guess that, that, that move away uh, from uh, downtown, uh, more home working and so on, does uh, it su sucks energy out, out, out of the centre. So wh what do those CBD areas have to do now to respond to that? Do they have to become more mixed use? I mean, the city of London, for instance, uh, uh, was uh, like Wall Street uh, uh, or is like Wall Street as a financial centre, uh, hardly any residential development. Uh, do those places have to become more mixed use in the future, do you think? Well, Wall Street, actually, if you stand on Wall Street today, there's only two office buildings left. Most of it's been converted to residential. So at, in the 1990s, there was an active government policy to convert old heritage buildings in the financial district into residential because Wall Street had that classic problem. It was an office district. And then at night it got very sleepy and kind of dark. And so now many, many families live in the New York's financial district. And so I, I think a big vibrant dense city has the ability to accomplish lots of different things. So in other words, you know, and you, and again, you have this in London where you're going to have a certain population that uses the Docklands and Canary Wharf, other people who will use the square mile um, and other people who are going to, you know, I've been fascinated to see, you know, I was at SOM years ago and SOM's office used to be at Clerkenwell and Clerkenwell used to be the edge of the city. And then now it feels like the center of the city because of the way the city has migrated. And I just think that big cities have that capacity. New York, you know, Midtown Manhattan is always going to be attractive for the people who are coming in and commuting from the area suburbs because that's where the commuter trains all come in. But you know, like Domino for a lot of creative industries, for people who live and work in New York City and bicycle to work, a place like that is extraordinarily attractive. So it's just it's 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 just different strokes for different folks, really. Um, you know, and I think a big city can handle that. And so, what sort of changes are you seeing taking place in San Francisco and the Bay Area as a result of COVID nineteen at the moment? Well, San Francisco is suffering from the same things that all of our large cities are. Small businesses are suffering, restaurants are suffering. San Francisco has a little bit of an advantage in the sense that the weather is, uh, is better. And so for outdoor dining and so forth, it's easier to accommodate. That's a big problem in New York as we enter the winter. Um, but, you know, the same that what we are seeing right now in many of our regional areas is areas like Berkeley and Oakland, which sit outside of San Francisco, are booming because people want a, they, a lot of people want to be in density, but a little less density. Right. So, you know, Berkeley is a city, but it's a city primarily of single family homes that's quite walkable and, and, uh, and bikeable because it's compact. And that seems to be quite attractive to people right now because they want to be able to, you know, I think things like elevators are scary right now and all of that kind of thing. But I would posit, Peter, that this is all temporary. That by, by you know, late 2021 into 2022, we will be having a very different conversation. And again, just like, you know, after 9-11, as part of the Bloomberg administration, we planned the High Line and the reintegration of the streets of the World Trade Center and the expansion of Columbia University and a lot of our urban waterfronts. And people thought we were crazy. We put a lot of investment and time and energy. Within a couple of years, the same people who are criticizing us for saying you're focused on the city too much, then criticized us for gentrifying the city and for creating too much congestion. So, you know, you, you, you really can't win in a certain way, but, the, um, but I, I really think the conversations will shift. San Francisco will bounce back. I mean, obviously, the other thing I'd say about San Francisco is that the tech sector has done very well through this crisis. We're on a, you know, a Zoom call. San Francisco is fueled by the tech sector. So I don't have long-term concerns about the San Francisco economy. I have long-term concerns about gentrification, about homelessness, about the fact that a lot of our black and brown communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID. Uh, we, we have enormous racial issues in the United States uh, that are territorial, that are uh, urban, 
that you know we really need to spend a lot of attention to, especially in terms of housing and social infrastructure. And um, do you think that is one of the things that might change as we come out of COVID-19, that we are actually more just as societies, we are more collaborative and all uh, say some of the positive aspects of going through this sort of trauma? Well, what I'd like to think is that one clear victim of the pandemic is the Thatcher Reagan uh, belief that the private sector could take care of everything. Because if there's ever proof that we need an activist government that needs to do its job and do it well, um, which is not about big government or small government, but smart government, then I think this is the clear illustration of that. And what I'm hope, I mean, we are speaking the day before the US election. I mean, you know, I'm very hopeful that uh, we will elect uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and that we're gonna see a, a, a very needed investment in housing and social infrastructure. And um, if we see that, I think we might be entering a new paradigm for how our cities get built. Well, let's hope so. So Vishan, thank you very much. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your support of cities too. And let's have this conversation in 12 months time. And I hope you're right that everything will be back, at least not absolutely to normal, but to some sense of normality. I, I look forward to that, Peter. And let's have that conversation in person, hopefully. Very good, look forward to it.